We're going to talk about the value of community. Um, it starts with God himself, right? We talk about the Trinity, that God is a triune God, it says. So that's Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So in, in, in his essence, in who he is, he represents community. And that is so integral for us to realize. Um, you know, obviously you look at the creation story and he created Adam. And then the scripture says, everything was good. And then when Adam did, but it's not good for man to be alone. So he created Eve, right? And, and, and they were in relationship. And obviously it continues to go, go forth after that. And this morning, I just want to talk about, I'm sure there's many more forms of this, but I want to talk about three forms of community. The first one is community with other believers or Christ followers, however you want to word that. Um, we'll talk about that. That's necessary. I want to talk about um, community with those that, I don't even know how to say this well, but that aren't Christians, you know, don't go to church, that sort of thing. Um, and then to to be able to have community with those that quote unquote might be different than us. And it could be people of color or different ethnicities. And I want to start raising awareness on that level as well. And, and we'll get to that at the end. So I'm naming the teaching how to redefine biblical community. And it's probably not even a good title because I shouldn't, it shouldn't be, it should just be biblical community. But I feel that we've blown it. If you look in, you don't have to look very far. We're supposed to be a, a Judeo-Christian nation, and yet you see all the tensions. You see all the, all the uh, divisions, you know? Um, so, does anyone, did anyone take the Bible reading? Does anyone have the Bible reading? Yes. Come on. Because this is uh, Jesus' prayer on unity. So I thought it would be... Please stand as you are able for the reading of God's word. John 17, 20 through 23. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. May God add his blessing to the reading, hearing, and doing of his word. Amen. So, sometimes... I think it's important to start backwards. So I want us to start with the end in mind. So in new creation, right? Not in creation, but in new creation. I took a verse from Revelation 7, verse 9. because so I want you to see a picture of what God had intended. When he first started in the garden, he had a vision. And this is what he intended to happen. But because of our free choice, evil entered the world. And we're left with the remains of that right now. But this is the picture that God has in mind to restore and to redeem. It says, after this, I looked and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, every tribe, people and language standing before the throne and before the lamb. And Galatians 3.28 also captures it this way. There is neither Jew nor Gentile neither slave nor free, nor there is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. That captures the picture of what God is after in and through us. So as I talk about community, I want you to think about inclusive, inclusivity and diversity. Okay? Hold on to those two words, because when I say biblical community, that's what comes to mind. The foundation is love, but it's about inclusivity and diversity. So let's first quickly talk about um, with other believers, other Christ followers. And I put getting spiritually fit because it's about maturing in our faith. Um, this is a very important quality, but I think sometimes we stay here. And um, this part of it helps us to learn to grow, to ask questions, to have accountability, to have encouragement, 
right? It's, it's necessary that we spend time with other believers so that we can grow together, okay? Now, Hebrews 10.24 says, And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. So this idea is we were not uh, created to become a holy huddle. All right. So if that's all we do, if that's the only form of community that we have, we're blowing it. And the statistics show, unfortunately, that once people become Christians, within two years, they don't have any non-Christian friends any longer. And it's always seemed so backwards to me because of what the gospel call us to do, to love others. And so now I think it's important with saying that some of us come out of a past, uh, say it's drugs and alcohol, whatever it is. And we were part of a group of people that that was taking place. So to remove yourself in order to get healthy and get well is just wise. Okay. So I'm not saying once you become a Christian to not separate yourself from those types of folks. That would be a very important thing to do. But if this just becomes your social life and all the people you hang out with are the people that you see here, we're missing it. Okay, So that's just one form of community. And, and so when you see that, I want you to be able to look at yourselves and say, how can we help each other grow in our faith? How can we encourage one another? When you have talks, when you talk with people here on Sundays, to listen to what's going on in their life so that you can encourage and support. And that would lead me to this other aspect of this same point. One of the values of having the body of Christ together and spending time with one another is to meet each other's needs. So Galatians 6 says, carry each other's burdens and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. Um, and I just wanted to highlight a quick story of, of actually Shane and my friend Chris Chuck. Is Chuck here? Chuck, somewhere back there. Okay. So Chuck and Shane, um, the three of us are good friends, but Chuck and Shane, over the years, um, are just like they're brothers, you know, they're family. And one of the things that I've loved about that situation is that they were intentional about coming into each other's lives and supporting one another. And I've just watched, and this gets me very emotional because I've watched how um, Shane has entered into that family. So as Chuck and Misty have had children, he's just been there and he's been such a vital part of their lives. And I would suggest that the kids, I think they even call him Uncle Shane, you know, he's part of that family. And that doesn't just happen, right? It, it, takes, uh, it takes time. It takes sacrifice. It says, I'm going to engage with another person. And so they've been able to help each other grow in their relationship with God in tremendous ways. And then at the same time, very practically, Shane has been able to help and meet as a lot of different needs in their home. And so I felt like that was just a really good example of as you get to know people. I mean, I, I know story after story after story where people have I've heard needs and then entered into that to help meet that need. Um, here at church, I'm going to be talking about opportunities to build community here at Stone Coast. So with other church folk, first of all, I want it to be organic. I do want it to just happen. There's a reason why we're a very laid back church. There's a reason why at the beginning, we just kind of, people get here and they just socialize. Then during the break, we kind of take an elongated break because I want you to get to know people. I don't want it to be this formality. Like this is what we do. We just come, we come to church, we listen, we go. I want you to get to know people. Um, but it's up to you to be organic means that you all have to be intentional with trying to get to know people. So again, the value here is, as, especially as new people come in, because if you've been coming here for a few months, all of a sudden you're, being com you're becoming comfortable. And now you're starting to form the same friends and you go to the same people each and every week and you start saying hi, hi to them, but then new people are coming in and you stop to, you don't see them. We always have to be aware of that. As new people come in, I want this to be known as a friendly church. Um, in a welcoming church. So always go out of our way to introduce ourselves to new folks. Okay. Um, the other thing is once you, once you find people that, you know, take it to the next level, start going out for lunch, start going out for dinner. You know, then maybe you do a book study together. Maybe you do a Bible study together. The church doesn't have to be the one catering to that. You know, I don't have to do that. You are adults. You can figure that out. 
grab two or three people that, are, that live next to you. Grab a couple of people that live in, that you work with. Whatever it is. Take responsibility because it's your life in Christ that you want to develop your faith. All right? Um, now, what we will do as a church, because I do think that there's an, op an opportunity for us to catalyze this, to be catalytic, is a couple of times each year, rather than having like ongoing what they call small groups, a lot of you may have a church background where it's like they try to get us into small groups each and every week type of thing, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, I just, I, I look at it differently because I want us to be all forms of this community, not just this one form of community, okay? And you'll see, each of these takes sacrifice and time. So if I'm constantly asking you to, to sacrifice your time to only be with other believers, we're missing out on these other forms of community. So I want to leave room for both. But a couple of times a year, what we will do, coming up in the winter, I think it'll be January, um, January slash February, we'll take four to six weeks. And we'll, we'll do a topic together. So whatever we're talking about here on Sunday mornings, we'll probably do a book where everyone can read a book together. And we'll do home groups and you can meet over a meal. Um, and again, it's to get to, to know each other better, right? In a very casual way. But at the same time, we're growing in a certain topic. So we'll do that a couple of times a year. All right. And then lastly, to see a need and meet a need. And if you look at our website, right on the front page, it talks about God's work, our hands. And so as you start to hear people in this room, what their struggles are and what, where they need help, will we sign up? You know, will we go out of our way to make a difference? And so as a, as a team, we're trying to figure out how to... Uh, capture that on an online way, in an online way. All right, so we'll be figuring that out. But like even today, someone said to me, why didn't you visit me when I was sick? And he was really a nice guy, this guy Steve <laughs> over there, you know what I mean? Where were you? Right, as if it has to be me. <laughs> I didn't know about it, right? So, um, and that's one of the things. If I'm the only one visiting people, we've got it wrong. Okay, that's, that's, that's not what it's about. If we're, all, if we're Christ followers, when we see a need, we meet a need. So that's par partly what I do because I'm a Christian, not because I'm a pastor. Okay? Um, and I want all of us to take that responsibility. All right? You got that one? So that's just one form of it. The second form is to be intentional with spending time with those who may have given up on church. And I, like I said, I don't know if it's unchurched, de church I don't, I don't know how you say it. But this is, to me, at the heart of the gospel. And if we're only spending our time with other believers, we miss out on why the very reason Jesus Christ came to earth. So let me read to you Luke 19, 10. For the Son of Man, very simply, came to seek and to save the lost. And then it captures it more in Mark 2. While Jesus was having dinner, I love that, having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples. For there were many who followed him. When the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, so, the religious folks, saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said to them, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Now, I think Jesus was a very, very busy person. But a part of his why, why was he here? Was to intentionally spend time with quote unquote sinners and tax collectors. And the way it's put in scripture, like, because I think that's all of us too. <laughs> We're all sinners. But I think the way that it's written, it is saying that it's not talking about those that are followers of Christ in that way. It is talking about the sinners and tax collectors. This other group of people that he's saying, I am going to engage with. And I always thought, like, this is so cool. He's going to parties. He's going to dinners. He's having um, story time. He's hanging out with them. And he's getting to know them. Why? Because he's saying that he wants to establish a new kingdom, a new way of doing life. And he needs his disciples to get this. And you can see there was, it was the rub. Because the religious folks of the day were going, this doesn't make any sense. Why would he do this? Because it was going against the teachings of, of removing oneself, becoming holy, being separate. Okay? And I know that there's scriptures that talk about that. So that's what we talked about. There's tensions to be managed. There's competing truths in scripture that we have to hold at the same time. But this teaching is at the heart of who Jesus Christ is. And he's telling us it's vitally important that we rub elbows and spend time with those that don't know him. Okay? 
I feel like this is one of the biggest things in all of the capital C church in America that gets violated all the time. And I talked to two reasons. One, I already said the holy huddle syndrome, where we just come to church and we, hit, we spend time with church people. That's it. The other one is that what I talk about a lot is that we just get forced and stuck into the way of life where all we do is wake up, take care of the kids, go to work, come home, put the kids down and watch TV and go to bed, right? We talk about that a lot. So if we will not be intentional where I'm saying I'm going to carve out time in my schedule so that I can spend time with people, I can get to know people, you know, and, and I was thinking about this, it's like, how many of us actually have meaningful conversations? I would say so many of us have very, very shallow conversations. You know, it's about the news and the weather and sports and things like that. But how many of us engage with other people about real matters? And, and one of the things I want to make sure I say, when we're doing this, it is not about getting another person saved. Okay, that's old Christian terminology. And we've all but heard it. That is not the objective of hanging out with those that don't know Christ. The objective is to love them unconditionally, to spend time with them and get to know them on a very human, real level. So guess what? The people that I hang out with, we end up talking about God a lot because guess what? That's a part of who I am. I'm not gonna hide a part of who I am from someone that I care about. Just like I expect them to share with me the stuff that they're doing. They're, they're sleeping around with someone. I don't want to hear about that because I'm a Christian. Guess what? That's where they're at. I'm not going to judge them for it. I'm, not, I'm just going to be part of their lives. They can tell me whatever they want to tell me. It's not going to shock me. It's not going to surprise me. It's not going to do anything except be interesting. <laughs> I get to know you a little bit. Okay? Just spend time with people. Get to know them, accept them for where they're at and who they are, and have authentic dialogue. And I tell people all the time, I have more meaningful spiritual conversations with people because of that. And it happens very naturally. It's not forced. It's not something that I have to work at. It's something because I've formed relationships with people. So I want to encourage you to do that because I feel it's something that we really, really struggle with. And the reason we struggle with it is because they don't believe the same way we do. And we have a hard time getting past that. Jesus is setting an example for us. This is why he spent time. Why is it captured of all the stories? There's a lot of stories obviously aren't mentioned in scripture. They didn't capture every single detail. This is important. And this is why he highlights this. And he was highlighting it to his disciples. So opportunities. Decide to be intentional. Put it in your calendar on a regular basis to have people over the house. To go out to lunch, to go out to breakfast, just to hang out, whatever it is, but be intentional about it. All right. Gotta get your shot clock. I know, right? <laughs> Last form of community that we'll talk about today is build friendships with people of color and different ethnicities. Now, this is something I personally want to get better at. Um, that's well. Can you put up that website again? The, the one with the I think the prejudice test. This is why I want us to take this. I took this, and um, I feel because I've had this belief all my life. Like I don't consider myself prejudiced. Okay, but at the same time, my demo, my demographic, my geographic here, where I live. There are not a lot of opportunities, if you will. There's not a lot of diversity in Seekonk, okay? So I don't spend a lot of time with people from different ethnicities. Um, I don't think it's because of like a prejudice that I have. But at the same time, I wanna make sure I challenge that. I wanna make sure that I, it's, I'm more pure in that. And uh, so Francis and I, she doesn't know how much she's helping me in this. Uh, and I'm just going to say one part of our conversation because what we're trying, um, I asked her because this specific test is about, I think it's, um, does it say black and white on that test? Or race? There's like 20 tests. 
So you can test yourself about anything that you might Any, have, uh, So it's generally on prejudices, on right? So you can do a bunch of different tests. The one that Francis asked me to take, I, was the one that he asked me to take yeah, black, and white, black and white? Black and white. Black and white. how I would fare. Okay. But what we're trying to do, even though we're doing that, she, we both agree. But when you, if you leave here thinking this is about black and white, we failed. See what I mean? Because that's why I started with the end in mind when I talked about revelations. It's about, that's why I said, try people of color and different ethnicities. Because what mass media does is they capture it and they try to make it about black and white. Okay? Um, I think, and I'll say this as a white person, I need to, I need to check my spirit. I need to make sure that I'm loving all people the same. And so maybe you'll be surprised by taking this test. And like I said, you can do it. We'll leave this up after the teaching. You can hang out, take it. It takes about five minutes. You can take it right now. If you're bored, whatever you want to do. Um, you can do it. I'll, I'll, put it in the, um, I'll put it in the newsletter. You can take it during the week. But I think what it does, it helps you see where you're at as a starting point. And then I would suggest most of us wouldn't say, like, I'm flat out ignorant and I'm prejudiced, blah, 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 in whatever area, right? But we might be, meaning we might be have biases that we're not even aware of. And so these tests help us to bring awareness to that. And I think that's great because then we can go, God, help me with that. Because that's not who I want to be. Okay? Um, so let me read a scripture because I think, again, following Jesus' lead, he was always putting the disciples into a very uncomfortable situation. And he, he brought them into through Samaria. And you know the story about the Samaritan woman. And it was like, the Jews and Samaritans hated each other. This was a group of people, and they did. They took it, categorized a group of people that they despised and tried to avoid. Okay, so Jesus is saying, it is not right in this new kingdom that I'm establishing to avoid certain people groups. It's just not okay. Okay, so he, he brings them into that situation, forces them to see it, to realize it, to get in it. Because he knows as human beings, we can be susceptible to these things. We see the horror on TV all the time. When we see these things, we see the shootings and the murders. It's two, um, two things happen. One, we see so many of them that we become desensitized. That's one thing we got to be very careful of, not being desensitized. And then making those snap judgments. I would caution you, if when you read these things and hear these things, to pause and remind yourselves that first and foremost, we are kingdom citizens and we should not see color. That's the goal. And I know I see hints of color. So my goal is to keep working on that before God and say, I do not want to see the color of a person's skin. I want to see the person. And I hope that that's our prayer as a church. Francis, do you want to share before we watch the video, or do you want me to share the video and then come up? Okay, come on. So, um, because of this test, I thought I would, um, when we talk about vital Christianity, as a living, intentional, breathing, vital Christian, what comes to my mind, emotions, and thoughts when I think about the words uncivilized, dangerous, more violent? What comes to my mind when I think about structural oppression? What do I think of community when I speak or hear the words lack of growth within community? And how do I see the church operating in that? What do I think about when I hear partiality, avoider, inclusive, 
bigotry, diversity, respect, prejudice, racism, preferential, bridge builder, For that little child with no father. For that man that doesn't have a place to stay. And for that little boy living with AIDS. Can I tell you a story? Tell you a story. You can lean on me. There's a man oh, yeah. standing on the corner. He has no home. He has no food. And his blue skies are gone. Yes, it is. Can you hear him crying now? And there's a girl searching for a father and a friend, praying that storm someday will end. But instead. Can't you? 
you're also my brother. Here's my shoulder. You can lean on me. Hallelujah.